Good afternoon and welcome to all of our guests and distinguished panel members. Thank you for joining us today for a joint event held by the Kurdish Institute of Paris and the Washington Kurdish Institute. I'm Sirwan Nejmadeen Karim, president of the Washington Kurdish Institute. And before we get started today, I would like to ask for a moment of silence to remember and honor those who were killed during Saddam Hussein's chemical attacks in Halabja, as today marks the 34th anniversary. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, today's discussion will focus on the situation in Afrin and other areas of Syrian Kurdistan that are occupied by Turkey and their jihadist proxies. We are very fortunate to be joined by several experts, including Dr. Nadine Menza, chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. She'll be discussing the status of religious freedom before and after the Turkish occupation, as well as current issues facing the population. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Nazand Begekhani, a leading researcher on gender-based violence focused on women in war and examining rape and sexual violence during conflicts in Iraq and Syria. Uh, Dr. Begekhani will give a presentation on the hidden reality for women in Afrin, highlighting the sexual and gender-based violence taking place under Turkish occupation. And we will also hear from Mrs. Sina Mohammed. Syrian Democratic Council representative to the United States. Uh, she will discuss how life has changed under Turkish occupation in Afrin and the other areas of Syrian Kurdistan that are occupied by Turkey. And finally, we will hear from Professor Manan Sleiman, leader of the European and American Solidarity Committee for Afrin. Uh, he will discuss the methods that have been used by the Turkish government to eradicate the Kurds of Afrin and replace them with families of Arab and Turkmen jihadists brought from other areas of Syria. And after we hear from our speakers, we'll take a few questions from our guests. Uh, Dr. Manza, we'll be, uh, begin with you. Um, thanks so much. And thank you to the Washington Kurdish Institute and the Paris Kurdish Institute for including me in this important event and to mark the fourth anniversary of the Turkish invasion of Afrin and its districts. Although I was involved in religious freedom advocacy and was regularly in Washington, D.C. for events and meetings, I don't ever remember hearing about the invasion of Afrin until I joined the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, or USERF, in May of 2018, just two months after it had occurred. How could something as significant as this happen with hardly any international outrage? I went back and read the March 2018 New York Times coverage, and, and it made it sound like the Syrian opposition was just expanding into a frame to stop terrorists and Kurdish autonomy. Since these were the folks fighting Assad, they must be the good guys, right? It seems the invasion of Afrin has been among the biggest mistakes that Turkey and the Syrian opposition made in this civil war. After this, they could no longer sell themselves as the righteous answer to an evil Assad. Instead, these Islamist militias on the ground in Afrin appeared to be an evil answer to an evil Assad. They showed that they cared about the well-being of civilians about as much as Assad did. Don't misunderstand, I have great respect for many people and even some of the leaders involved in the Syrian opposition working to topple Assad and his horrific Ba'athist regime. And they seem to have little control on the ground. With this week being the 11th anniversary of the onset of the Syrian civil war, my heart breaks for the 350,000 killed, their families, the 13 million forced from their homes and displaced, and the others who have been victims of horrendous war crimes are unfairly imprisoned and tortured. But those living in Syria right now, who is going to risk their lives and those of their families fighting for the Syrian opposition if this is what life will look like for them? The invasion of Afrin should be a subject lesson in what not to do if you want people to rally around your cause. The people in Northeast Syria were part of those who sacrificed to oppose Assad, and they have been the only ones successful. They built a government, the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria, or AENES, where all have freedom of thought, conscience, and religion as promised for all in Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was ratified by 48 countries in 1948, including Turkey and Syria. The fact that half of the leaders are women even further proves how exceptional they are. Of course, this young government is imperfect and would benefit from US guidance and support. Afrin was part of the AENES and considered the crown jewel of Syria, untouched by the civil war. Then Turkey invaded, instituting conditions one might have expected from the ISIS caliphate, not a NATO ally. The Turkish-backed Syrian opposition and the Islamist militias working for them have cleansed the area of religious and ethnic minorities, 
forcing most Kurds, Christians, and Yazidis to leave. Multiple independent organizations, including the United Nations, have documented these horrific crimes that have also included killings, rapes, kidnapping, extortion, forced conversion, land appropriation, arrest of Christians for apostasy, and torture. In my four trips to Northeast Syria, I've met with victims and heard firsthand about these crimes, most recently in January. Even this past year, Yusuf is reporting of continued egregious crimes in Afrin, especially against Yazidi and Kurdish women and girls, including kidnapping, sex trafficking, and even lethal torture. The destruction of Yazidi and Christian religious sites and cemeteries further shows their contempt for these religious communities. In September, these Islamist militias are often called Turkish-supported Syrian armed opposition groups, or TSOs, such as the Syrian National Army, the NSF sorry, SNA, and numerous factions of its Turkish-backed Free Syrian Army, or the TFSA, merged under the Syrian Liber Liberation Front. Of course, this is being done with Turkish financing and military support. So it seems they keep rebranding because you saw how confusing that was. So maybe it will be harder for the media and the international community to easily see the long history of violence and war crimes. President Erdogan has accused all the people of Northeast Syria of being members of the Kurdistan Workers' Party or the PKK, using it as a ludicrous excuse to invade Afrin and other areas they occupy and to continue to violate the ceasefire agreement with Erdogan made with Vice President Pence in 2019 following Turkey's third invasion. Their regular shellings and drone strikes often kill civilians, including women and children. Its targeting of Syriac Assyrian villages in the Kabr Valley has forced some of the last remaining Christians who survived the ISIS genocide to flee, continuing the troubled democratic, demographic change in that area as well. It's troubling that Turkey continues to conduct airstrikes against displaced Afrin residents, many of them Yazidis in areas outside of Aleppo. Turkey forcing them to leave their homes in Afrin was just not enough. In April of 2020, Yusuf first made some bold recommendations to the U.S. government to support the autonomous administration of North and East Syria because of their remarkable religious freedom conditions. The recommendations we have focused on the most that have, could have the most immediate impact would be to lift sanctions on areas governed by the autonomous administration. The U.S. government often sanctions governments for egregious religious freedom violations, so why not reward a government for positively transforming human rights and religious freedom conditions? They're at a point they could either become an aid economy or a commerce economy, and U.S. policy is the key to determining that. Another important recommendation was to expand engagement with the autonomous administration. It's imperative since the previous administration did not directly engage with the government, only the Syrian Democratic Forces and the Syrian Democratic Council. Fortunately, the administration is now doing that on multiple levels. Another positive sign is the recent trip to Northeast Syria by Deputy Assistant Secretaries Ethan Goldrich and Jennifer Gavado, as well as the National Security Council official Zara Bell. USAID is also deeply engaged and has provided important economic assistance, like seeds for farmers delivered at a crucial time, and I'm thankful for the open door at the State Department and the National Security Council to discuss these important events and issues. For these reasons, I'm encouraged even in these most difficult times. Other USERF recommendations include pressuring Turkey to provide a timeline to withdraw from the Northeast, including Efrain, give political recognition to ANES as a local legitimate government, and include ANES in all talks for a political solution per UN Resolution 2254. Perhaps if Turkey does veto ANES inclusion in activities with the Syrian opposition, the US should bring them to Geneva and run parallel meetings to make it clear they belong as any part of a US-backed final solution for Syria. As the only successful government in Syria for one third of the country, it is ridiculous that these discussions include those governing in Afrin, but those who built this bottoms up inclusive government that gives everyone a seat at the table, regardless of ethnicity, religion, or gender are excluded. USERF recommendations are also the best way forward for a frame as well. A stronger ANES gives a frame the best chance of rejoining and regaining the human rights, religious freedom, and the gender rights they deserve. I'm particularly interested in hearing the next presenters who will delve deeper into the situation into a frame and report about life under this horrific occupation, how women are suffering and the ethnic cleansing happening openly. For those watching, please consider how you can join me in making sure the world cannot continue to just look away. Regardless of what country you are in, you can share this information with lawmakers, government officials, journalists, or tell the story yourself on social media. Keeping this story alive is how we make sure Afrin will have a chance at freedom again, and that the people of Afrin will have the opportunity to return to their homes and live a life of dignity. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, Doctor Nezent, are you ready 
to give your presentation? Yes, yeah, thank you very much. I'm so sorry to have joined you late, but uh, well, my time... understanding was that it was at six o'clock Central Euro Europe time. This is why. Yeah, we uh, changed our clocks here, so I think it got mixed up a little bit. But uh, yeah. if you're ready, we're, we're ready for you. Okay, thank you very much. I would yeah. like to share my screen to show my PowerPoint. Uh, sure. If you bear with me, yeah. Please. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I am going to, sh as, as, as you can see from the title, I'm going to talk about the situation of women under the Turkish occupation. Uh, from a gendered perspective. Uh, this is um, a preliminary uh, finding of my research on the subject, and I will try to highlight the different atrocities committed uh, against women by extremist members of Turkish-backed militia groups, uh, such as Ahrar uh, um, al Hamza, Sultan Murad Brigade, I mean, the list is as long as you know. Um, and uh, my aims are to shed light on the plight of women with evidence-based information, uh, hoping to increase international public awareness to inform policy and uh, encourage effective uh, um, uh, intervention. Uh, to, to give some context without repeating what has been said earlier, since the Turkish invasion of the um, in, the, in the beginning of 2018 uh, of Afrin, uh, the city is controlled by militia groups and proxy fighters equipped and supported by Turkey. Human rights organizations, local NGOs and media uh, agencies, as well as independ the Independent um, International Commission of Inquiry on Syria, documented persistent and terrible human rights violations against the indigenous populations, including Yazidis, Christians, and Kurds. Um, these populations have experienced forced displacement, summary murder, abduction, arbitrary detention, torture, property theft, extortion, and many forms of sexual and uh, uh, gender-based violence. The list on this slide has been documented by women's rights groups and the researchers verified by different UN commissions and agencies, as well as by Amnesty International, among others. Um, so women and also men have been subjected to multiple forms of sexual abuse and gender-based violence. They were removed forcibly from their homes. Reports highlighted how elderly widowed women were booted out and their homes were taken by militia groups. Girls have been prevented from going to school, prevented from wearing normal school or Kurdish dress and forced to wear the hijab. And there, are, uh, there have been reports saying that Yazidis were forced to convert to Islam and some of them were coerced to marry militia members. Uh, the UN Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances investigated between May 2019 and May 2020 and highlighted cases of enforced disappearance, including of girls and women perpetrated by various militia groups affiliated with the uh, Turkish uh, army. Um, the local agencies and media groups also reported on systematic abduction followed by extortion, forcing relatives to ransom these people back and when families couldn't afford to pay, they were kept in unknown detention centers, tortured and faced with sexual violence, including systematic rape, according to women's rights groups. Uh, some women's rights um, groups, uh, activists, uh, uh, reported that in the detention center, women have been forced to pose naked, and some of these pictures have circulated through social media. Uh, this method is used as a way to humiliate and dishonor women, and through the act, dishonoring the whole community. Uh, cases of sex trafficking also has been reported. Uh, but re rape remains the most severe act of sexual violence practiced 
against Kurdish women in Afrin, um, women's rights advocates whom I had the privilege to interview told me that uh, rapes uh, were conducted repeatedly, not only by militia members, but also by Turkish soldiers and army officers did nothing to prevent, no punish perpetrators. This can be explained as the act being ordered from, from the top and used as a war strategy against the Kurdish population. And uh, the, the uh, UN Independent International Commission of Inquiry uh, uh, on, on Syria reported in June 2020 that many women and girls were detained by Syrian national army fighters are subjected to rape and sexual uh, violence. Uh, there is uh, the cases of many of abduct, uh, abducted and missing women have been documented by um, independent researcher Megan Baudet, uh, who has uh, initiated a great project called the Afrin Missing Women. She collected data through local uh, media agencies and human rights uh, groups in, and documented 150 cases of missing women. Uh, and the project includes a website with interactive uh, uh, map listing the names of the individuals the date and uh, uh, the location of the incidents. Uh, the, uh, here is the interactive map showing the last known location of each missing woman, their pictures and uh, other uh, details. Um, whoops. Uh, In addition to these sources, um, Amnesty International and other human rights organizations reported on cases of summary killings of women. Uh, they also found bodies of unidentified women with signs of torture. Havrin Khalaf, the famous Kurdish politician and secretary general of the future Syria party is just one example. She was brutally killed by Ahrar uh, al sharqiya on October 12th, 2019. Amnesty International verified the video footage and reviewed also a medical report shedding light on how Havrin was ambushed on 8, uh, 12th October on the highway between Raqqa and Qamishli and dragged out uh, of her car, beaten and shot dead uh, in cold blood. Um, her bodyguard uh, was also summarily killed. Um, the, in, in a report published on uh, 18 February, uh, October 2019, Amnesty International concludes, the information gathered provides damning evidence of indiscriminate attacks in residential areas and also reveals gruesome details of a summary killing in cold blood of a prominent Syrian Kurdish female politician Havrin Khalaf by members of Ahrar al sharqiya The report goes on to state that Turkish military forces and their allies have displayed an utterly callous disregard for civilian lives launching unlawful deadly attacks in residential areas that have killed and injured civilians. And Amnesty International categorizes this along with other human rights abuses as evidence of uh, war crimes. Uh, it's not only human rights organizations, but the US State Department is, is also well aware of these atrocities and produced two substantial reports including this one in which it refers to mon uh, monitors and observers who documented the trend of Turkish supported uh, uh, opposition. Uh, here we are, which uh, states that the US is deeply concerned by reports that Turkish supported opposition groups engage in gross violations of human rights and violations of the law of our uh, of armed conflict in northeast uh, Syria. Uh, it's not only, uh, as I said, uh, human rights organizations, uh, these atrocities have been well documented. 
uh, and uh, uh, the practices uh, according to uh, many human rights activists are not different from what Afghan women experience under the rule of the Taliban. In fact, Kurdish activists whom I interviewed uh, for this paper believe that among Turkey, Turkish uh, proxy fighters, there are extremist members who are similar to Taliban and ISIS in their treatment of women. Uh, reports indicate that different forms of sexual and gender-based violence against women in Afrin and in other Turkish occupied territories are part of the revenge strategy by extremist uh, fighters, and proxy members. Um, the revenge strategy, as argued by media analysts and researchers, is set up to counter many advances Kurdish women had achieved since 2012 in Rojava, especially in relation to gender equality and women's empowerment. These crimes enter into the category of hate crime because they are committed on the basis of victims' ethnic, religious, and gender identities. Uh, and what's the rationale of uh, the militia groups, if any, for, for their re revenge strategy? Uh, we all know that violence against women has a long history in the region and it's deeply rooted in the patriarchal mentality of the ruling parties in Syria. Uh, the U.S. State Department, using data verified by local and international organizations, indicated in its 2020 report that Syrian parties involved in the conflict committed at least 11,520 acts of sexual violence since the civil war started, and that the uh, Assad regime's forces were responsible for at least 8,020 cases of sexual violence. And the report adds that 80, 70, 879 cases occurred inside Syrian detention centers, and there were 440 three violations against girls and young girls younger than age 18. Um, the report also adds that regime authorities subjected men and women as well as children in detention center to sexual and gender-based violence including rape, sexual torture and abuse and other forms of humiliating and degrading uh, treatment. Uh, In, in, in uh, Syria's uh, Kurdish autonomous region known as Rojava, the situation has been different since 2012. There has been a gender equality strategy with many measures for the legal protection of women, their participation in politics and in military senior uh, positions. Women have been equally represented in the leadership and in institutional structures. They have been actively involved in the fight against ISIS, uh, not only as fighters, but also as commanders. Um, so human rights activists and researchers argue that Erdogan and his extremist-backed fighters have been targeting women with the aim of destroying the advances in gender equality and women's rights achievement. Uh, in, in the autonomous administration of uh, Rojava. Uh, these multiple forms of sexual and gender-based violence are not the byproduct of war and conflict happening because of the disruption of order. They consist of a systematic military policy commanded by army officers adopted as both a strategic aim and a weapon of war uh, and they are recognized by the International Criminal Court as crimes of war, crimes against humanity, and also as genocide when happening systematically with political goals. How can Turkey and its backed military groups be held accountable for these crimes? Uh, among 10 young Kurdish diaspora members whom I interviewed online for this paper, eight believe that there is a disparity between the Western rhetoric of human rights and their uh, policies with regards to Kurds. Uh, they describe it as a Western political and moral cynicism. 
while these Kurdish uh, human rights advocates all support Ukraine and condemn Putin's war, they are deeply disappointed by the lack of a firm political response when Turkey invaded Syria and the Kurdish autonomous region and Erdogan's violation of uh, international law. The impunity of Turkey can go further if the West continues to sell arms to Turkey, which are used in its ethnic cleansing against the Kurdish population. So in the pursuit of justice, investigating these crimes is a challenging task, not only because sexual and gender-based violence are sensitive issues, even in normal settings, uh, they are not easy to, to investigate, but also because since the Turkish offensive in Rojava, it's been difficult for researchers and scholars to conduct field activities. According to Amnesty International, for instance, in southern Syria, since the U.S. withdrawal, the Turkish occupation and the control of the province by Turkish-backed militia groups, research and inquiry activities have been seriously hampered. The UN Independent International Commission uh, uh, produced in August 2020 a report highlighting the risks of retaliation and other concerns which hamper the capacity to investigate human rights violations in Syria, especially in relation to summary killing, abuse and torture in detention centers. Um, so in the face of this reality, human rights advocates and researchers, whether affiliated to academic institutions or to humani humanitarian and human rights groups, can only rely on secondhand data. This data uh, uh, will have been uh, verified uh, through multifaceted methods with strict ethical uh, uh, principles. So to conclude, uh, I would like to say that in the face of international silence, it's our duty as scholars, as human rights advocates, media editors, humanitarian organizations to raise awareness about these atrocities, to allocate resources to investigate these crimes thoroughly, to collect data, to establish facts, document cases, and produce an evidence-based body of knowledge, which can be used not only to inform policy and action, but also to help legal experts to advocate for a special tribunal suing perpetrators of uh, these crimes in Afrin and in the wider Syria. Um, because we all know without justice, we cannot achieve uh, the much needed peace, reconciliation and security in our turbulent world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nazan Begahani. Uh, that was very eye-opening and, and troubling to see the conditions that these women live under. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Mrs. Sina Mohammed, uh, Syrian Democrat Democratic Council representative to the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, um, I would like to thank Kurdish Washington Institute and the uh, Kurd Institute in Paris for organizing this uh, panel. It's very important panel actually to discuss about the Afrin and which has been, uh, we can say, forgettable. Everyone is silent about what's going on in Afrin. Uh, before we, we talk about, I mean, what's going on now, let us say, what was Afrin like before the occupation? What was Afrin like before four years ago? You know, uh, Afrin, it is uh, a city which has been, which has uh, actually uh, 366 uh, villages in Afrin. And the population of Afrin, percentage of the population, of the Kurdish population of Afrin is about 98% are Kurds in Afrin and the others are Arabs there. Uh, so uh, the, the Afrin is famous in a very, uh, in, in its uh, olives oil. It's about 18 million olives, oil, uh, uh, olives trees are in Afrin. 
again, in addition to um, uh, even millions of the fruit trees in Africa. That means Africa is very famous in olives, trees in olives oil, in, uh, in uh, fruits and everything. So others, uh, the, the other uh, thing, Africa has multi-nations, multi-religions, we can say. In Africa, we can see the Muslim Sunni, and you can see the Yazidis and Alawite. So all these multi-religions, Alawite, uh, for instance, in Azidi, we have 25 villages, Yazidi villages in Africa. All they are living together in peace, and the autonomous administration in Africa was providing them all the services for all the people without any differentiation between Arabs or Kurds or any other religious minorities. And there is also the, the languages, actually there is official languages in Africa, which is Arabic and Kurdish language. And the head of the administration that time in Africa, she was a woman. So that we can say the autonomous administration was based on equal genders, on religious or freedom of religions, on democracy, and on security to save and to, to keep this city safe and secure. But if we, if we see after the occupation what happened, these beautiful pictures have been uh, upside down, just it has been changed completely. So the beautiful offering of the olive trees, more than one million of the olive trees has been cut by the mercenaries backed by Turkey. When Turkey and its uh, back uh, militias or uh, the, the groups, military groups with different groups, when they occupied Afrin, they committed uh, ethnic cleansing, demography changing, and it's still going on. It still it doesn't stop till now. Uh, I'm from Afrin, and I know how the people of Afrin suffered, and one of them, my family. My family was in Afrin. Their properties, their houses, everything has been occupied, and now they are displaced outside of Afrin in Chahba and in the Northeast Syria now. They lost everything. Even now, many of the families of Afrin, they are the same. They are suffering the same. The people who stay in Afrin, they are under pressure now, either by kidnapping them, arresting them, and asking to get a ransom in order to free them. And this is what's happening daily for all the people in Afrin. Just when they arrest anyone, accusing him being working with the previous administration, and they ask him to pay ransom. These groups who are in Afrin, they committed a lot of crimes. But unfortunately, no one talking about that. All the world is silent. Aside, we have many human rights organizations, they mentioned, United Nations, they mentioned about that in their report, but still they don't say, do anything. There is no action. There is only words that these are coming and going on in Afrin. It's going on in Afrin. But what, where is the action? How can to stop it? How can we stop all these violations that's going on in the region? How can we stop the... Uh, I think Professor Nazan, uh, she mentioned about the women and about all these things. I will not repeat it because we have many people that have been even documented as the women being raped in Afrin. And still we have now missing people, of women in Afrin, we don't know where are they. So who would be responsible for that? Who would be asking, I mean, what's the, 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 the fate of these people? Where are they now? We want to know that. Where are these women now? Are they still in the, in the present? Uh, or, or they are being killed? I don't know. I mean, we have to ask all the human organizations uh, human rights organization to investigate about all these things. So the, the ethnic cleansing is going on in Africa. Kurdish people are targeted now. So before we have 89, uh, 98 percentage Kurdish, now it is dropped down to 22 percentage of the Kurds people in Africa. 
and all the people now in Afrin majority, be now the, the fighters' families and the, the, the Islamist groups, uh, let me see the, say the radical groups who came to Afrin now and occupying the Afrinist people houses. Whereas the people of Afrin now, they are living in the camps since four years. And every year they are telling, how can we go back to our homes? They are waiting. They are waiting to go back to their villages and homes, as well as my family and me. So this is the, 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 uh, the Ezidi villages. Let us talk about the Ezidi villages. I said 25 villages. Where are the Ezidi now? Few of them remain there and would, are, are under pressure and the threat. And most of them, they left now because they are afraid. They were, they were uh, threatened. All the holy shrines of Yazidi people or Yazidi religions have been destroyed. And even the Christians, which was in Afrin, there were many Christians there, and they have only church, the only church has been destroyed and all the Christians family they, they left Afrin and they flee Afrin and they are seeking for, uh, of course, uh, safety. Now, most of them, they are in Aleppo city or in Kubani, where they have their church again. So the, the religious freedom, which was during the autonomous administration before four years, now not anymore existed. No freedom of religions in this. You can see only the, I'm a Muslim, and most of the majority of the Afrini also as Muslim, but we don't have all this uh, radicalism or this extremism against the people. Where we have, I mentioned that the Zidi, Alawite, all living together in a very peaceful way, working together in the administration. We want to build a new system in Syria, which depends on equal genders, on freedom of religions, on democracy. This is what we are looking for, for the future of Syria. But unfortunately, the Syrian National Army, which is, I can say, as they call the opposition, they are not doing what we, all the Syrian people, they, they, I mean, looking for. We look for dignity, freedom, democracy, plurality. Where, where are all these values? Nothing is there. Ahrar al-Shartiya, who killed Havreen Khalaf, and they are still committing many crimes in Afrin. They are listed as the terrorist groups. So what happened? They are still there. They are still continuing committing crimes in, the, in Africa. What about Sultan Murad? What about al Hamza? What about al Arshad, who committed daily, committed the crimes, arresting, killing, taking ransom, taking the properties of people? My properties has been occupied. And many people now, I don't know who is living in my house. Where is my mother-in-law? She is 75 years in Africa still. She is not able to go to her house. Forbidden. So where is the, the dignity here? Where is the plurality here? We don't have it. So we lost it in Africa. Everything has been changed. For that, I think the, the, the picture that we wanted to have it for the future of Syria, it has been destroyed in Africa. And if the future of Syria will be the same, what we are witnessing in Africa, it will be a catastrophe. The picture which, which we wanted in Syria, it is now in the Northeast Syria. It is as democracy, equal genders. The, the women, they have their position in each institution and in the position of the decision making. The, 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 uh, all the ethnicities, as the Kurds, Arabs, Syriacs, all they are together living, administrating the area together. And so we have now three official languages as Arabic, Kurdish, and Syriac language. This is what we want, plurality, democracy, freedom, equal gender. This is what we, the values that we wanted in, in all over Syria. And we are now, uh, trying to uh, empower it in the northeast Syria. Unfortunately, we have a lot of, uh, 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 I can say, a lot of challenges facing in, in our administration there. So what's going on in Afrin, it is also repeated in Ras al-Ain, and uh, Tal Abiyad. 
it's still there. So it, it looks that these groups with Turkey, they are targeting the Kurdish people there. They want to finish, they, the, I mean, Nadir, she mentioned by accusing So it should not be accepted because all the people of Afrin are Syrian. They are defending their land, defending their, their homes and their territory. And they don't have anything to do with any other groups outside of Syria. This is what we say. And we always, I mean, continue to say that. So uh, we, we, we witness now in Afrin also the demography changing by building the settlements. Unfortunately, many of the organization as a humanitarian organization on the name of a humanitarian organization who's funding from Qatar or from Kuwait, and they are building settlements for the people of the Arab Sunni people or the fighters family, the refugees who are in Turkey to come and to live in Africa. It is a kind of demography changing now. This is what's happening. They are taking the property of the people, building settlements in Africa now. And this is very dangerous. So for that, I call on United Nations, and I repeat it many times, to send an independent committee to investigate about all the crimes which are going on in Africa and to hold these groups who is committing the crimes accountable for that. Otherwise, only talking about the violations and doing nothing, it doesn't work, really. And I would like even to say, okay, Afrin has been occupied now since four years. And the people of Afrin in the camps, they are waiting now to go back to their homes. I would like to ask here, the, 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 United, the UN uh, Security Council, to hold a session about Afrin, talking about all this violation and talking about how can we end this occupation and to end all these violations so that the people of Afrin can go back to their homes and cities. It's enough. We want to finish all the, in, 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 in the displaced people. We want to a solution for the Syrian crisis. We know that if we don't have any Syria, I mean, solution, we will not settle all these people now in who are from Ghouta in Afrin. They have to go back to their cities. <laughs> so this will not happen unless we have a political solution. And political solution as the Syrian Democratic Council, the administration should be a part of this political solution. We should be a part of the constitution of the Syrian Const uh, Constitution Committee. We are secluded. So for that, I think we will not reach to any solution unless we have uh, the SDC, all the Syrian people coming together and being a part of this peace talk, either in the, in the political solution and in the Constitution Committee to guarantee the, the rights of the people there, to guarantee the rights of the Kurds, the Syrian, the women in this new constitution. And this is what I would like to ask for. And so that the people of Afrin can go, I hope they can go back to their city and villages and homes, and the people of Ras al Ain, Salitania, and Tal Abiyad also go back to their homes and, and end this occupation. Uh, thank you so much. I will stop here. Thank you, Mrs. Sina Mohammed, representative of the Syrian Democratic Council to the United States. Uh, next, we will hear from Professor Manan Suleiman. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, we're ready for you. Is it okay? Yeah. Can you see me? It's okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah, we yeah. Hi, everyone. So my presentation, it's about Afrin four years of darkness and Turkish occupation. I'm representing the European and American Solidarity Committee for Afrin. So the outline, there are many things to, to, to tell you and to talk about just uh, some, I will be quick because there are many things, just the first things I want to tell you. 
the station Afrin before the Turkish invasion, and since the station Afrin under the Turkish, uh, the aim of Turkish government is to eradicate the Kurds of Afrin and to replace them by Arab and Turkmen jihadist family brought from other regions of Syria. Now we have seen already where is Afrin, where is situated. Uh, just I want to know, everyone of you, you, you haven't been in Afrin, the name of Afrin in reality comes from the Kurdish mountain. Its name, it was in, uh, I have written here, in Kurdish Jai Kurda, or Jai Kurmaja, in Turkish, the Ottoman language of the ancestor of Erdogan is Kurdal. In French, La Montagne Kurd, in English, Kurdish mountain, and all the maps. In Arabic, Jabal al Kurd, Jabal al Akrad. So it was only Kurd in Afrin. There are no, the, so this one is already said. The population of Kurdish of Afrin is more than 95%. The regime before Assad they tried to Arabize Afrin, but didn't uh, succeed. They bring some tribes, Arab. But it doesn't succeed. But now it's much more uh, dangerous. So the estimated number of uh, population of 500,000. Um, I'm not talking about what's happened before the occupation. It was very, uh, they have economic life, labor market, health services, education, infrastructure. It was uh, more better than uh, other city and area of uh, Syria. So I'm going just to... Now, the real purpose of the occupation and its justification by Turkey, you have to know exactly. We have all the documents. The first time, it's not, I think it wasn't the first time, first occupation of Turkey in uh, Syria in Kurdish area. It was the second. The first one, look here, uh, Turkey came and occupied the uh, Bab, and the, or you can see, just to separate the Kurd from the east and the south, just to destroy all Kurdistan, just not to, uh, to make them disappear. That was the first occupation in El Bab. And then the Turkish army forces, what is the aim? They are telling everywhere, and it was being written, uh, they came to Afrin to neutralize the terrorists belonging to PKK for uh, Erdogan and for Turkey, all courts are PKK, KCK, PAD, APG, as an Islamic state in order to ensure security and stability in our border and the region. It's fake news. However, at the time of the invasion, there was no known credible Islamic state presence in Afrin. Uh, the other argument has been said to protect the border of Turkey and its neighbor. It has been said in uh, January 23, uh, 2019, Turkey says the YPG as an extension of PKK, which uh, Kurdish autonomy in Turkey since they are fighting for Turkish autonomy in Turkey since 1984. Uh, the YPG deny any direct military uh, or political links between PKK, the US and new country also reject Turkey's uh, portrayal. It's uh, YPG, it's an key ally in the battle against Islamic State. Uh, everyone of no, you, you know exactly the PG is a powerful with uh, a number of ethnic Syrian militia called the Syrian Democratic Forces with the help of US airstrike. As the fighters have succeeded to defeat Islamic State and capture many thousands of their fighters. Uh, what is extraordinary, Turkey declared occupied the Syrian region populated mainly with uh, by Kurd within the framework of international law of the Turkish Prime Minister in Kilis during of Afrin, he has said it's fake news as, as well. The other thing for Turkey, there are some uh, religious arguments. They say PAD, YPG, PKK, they are Islamists, they are atheists. They, don't, they are not believers. They must be fought and eliminated from Syria. Kurds in Syria are either Yazidi or communist or no believer. They have to be forced to be good Muslim and to <coughs> Sharia to be allowed. They are out of law. 
Our army is waging holy war, jihad, against those disbelievers in Afrin, the court of Afrin. The call for a holy war to free Afrin from the disbeliever was made by the Mufti of Turkey and the Imam, even in Europe, in the Mosque of Europe and on the border of uh, uh, Syria. Look at the Mufti and with the... Uh, Everything is clear for, for Erdogan, yes, to, to eradicate Kurds from Afrin, they are unbelievers. The holy uh, war is permitted, so it, everything is clear for him, for us. Now, with his uh, general army, the head of Dianat Ali Ebrash passed for a picture with the Lieutenant Turkish Second Army, Ismail Matin Temel, February 16, 2018. So everything is clear for them. At the holy war, we have to eradicate Kurds from Afrin. Uh, the real objective of Turkey, as I told you, is to render the Kurds a minority in Afrin by forcing them to an exodus during the aerial bombing, by preventing them to come back home after the invasion, by treating their home and go to its proxy's family as a Syrian Arab brought from uh, other area of Syria from Damascus, according to Turkish and Russian agreement, and later from Hama, Idlib, Hamas, and Dara. So what's happened? The means used by Turkey to achieve this means at uh, democratic change, arrest and kidnapping and ransom, destruction of infrastructure, explosion and bombing, degradation of archaeological site, destruction and survey of telecommunication, oil, olive confiscation and theft, robbery of God, machinery and car, everything, rapper and forced wedding, arbitrary killings. So now what's happening has been, Afrin has been aggressive from everywhere, you can see. Now we have the banner of the Islamist terrorists and of Turkey. Now they are bombing the area. There are the military the camp settled down in Afrin in order now it's transformed in uh, terrorist camp everywhere in all the area of Afrin and all the villages. You can see now the name of this uh, group of terrorists everywhere. And now they are engaged, as Silam uh, said, in the Syrian army under the Erdogan uh, Commander, now it's human rights organization of Afrin Syria released a shocking report. All of them are here at the Afrin. They are very proud. It's a Turkification. Look at the, uh, the Turkey flag. Now the number of population in 2004. It was 1,072 inhabitants. Between 2,500 uh, inhabitants, they were mostly came uh, from uh, Aleppo. There were a lot of Arab, and then to the 80 percent of Afrin inhabitants displayed near Aleppo, and uh, 6,000 new residents internally displaced from other Syrian region and uh, settler with Turkish support. And now there are some figures, statistics, I will, I will go now. Uh, uh, this, on this map you can show the settlement uh, funded by the uh, NGO from Brotherhood, Muslim Brotherhood Organization, from Qatar, from Kuwait, even from Palestinian area, Arab. They are funding, now you can show everywhere. There are a lot of... Uh, in, they are destroying in all Kurdish villages. They are building new settlement with Moscow, with him. a very ancient, very famous look what's happened. And what's, what is most dangerous for uh, yeah, those radical religious, all of them they are proxy jihadists, force African children to attend radical school, Turkish education program, it's uh, compulsory. 
the the teacher captured and forced to follow Turkish uh, in Turkish school. Well, compulsory from the age of seven for girl. Turkish special identity card is compulsory. Let's say pass it to move from one city to other area. Have a look at the flag of uh, Turkey. Uh, at uh, uh, everything, it's like because it's connected to Hatay. It no more belong to Syria. Everything in Turkish, even with uh, the identity card. Have a look. It's identity card. Now it's this uh, district of Sharan. Uh, Kishi number. Uh, so it's uh, everything is Turkish. So everything is clear. It become as uh, Turkey part. Uh, even telecommunication. Before in Syria, well, uh, Syria tell MTN communication tower, now it's destroyed or removed, became Turkish communication tower. Uh, what is even very, very uh, for me, it's uh, criminal. He has constructed a, a tower between Afrin and Aleppo in order to, to to forbid them from Kurdish people, of the Kurdish people in Aleppo to come back to their uh, village. And Afrin is administratively uh, attached to Turkish Atai. Have a look to the, to the wall. Uh, what was Afrin before? It was like a paradise, a lot of uh, grab of olives, every kind of fruit. Uh, this article is very interesting. It's uh, our friend uh, Shirin in uh, Washington. She has uh, with other advocate published in the U.S. Journal of International Affairs. Everything is clear in matter of law. So it's uh, it already said. I'm not uh, the violation in uh, its article. Uh, Already Nazan said, so there are a lot of things to see and said. It's the uh, occupation condemned by European Parliament as an illegal occupation of the security of Syria. Uh, nothing is our anonymous courts forced out of Africa after Turkish Asu. So everything is clear. President Macron said the same thing, Chancellor. Angela Merkel said, but nothing has been done. Uh, even at the uh, General Assembly, it said, uh, you have everything is clear now. We know who is uh, helping this terrorist. Now the obligation of Turkish state as an occupying power, uh, an occupying power normally has limited right of our territory and has obligation to respect our tenor commission on human rights. The force convention. No, I think it's respected. We're running the out force. of time. If we can uh, try to wrap it up in a minute or so, and then we can ask a couple questions because we have to be done in about 10 minutes. Sorry. Yes. Okay, um, we're going to go to a couple of questions before we wrap up here. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, so the first question is for uh, Dr. Nadine Menza. Uh, it says, in addition to Afrin, Turkey invaded more Kurdish areas in Syria in 2019, resulting in further mass displacement, ethnic cleansing, and forced demographic change. Do you see the U.S. and the West preventing additional Turkish invasions now that Turkey is marketing itself as a Western ally after the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Um, well, it's, it's hard to predict how things will change with, with the current um, situation with both Russia and, and Ukraine. I mean, Russia and Turkey because of the Ukraine situation. Um, but, but I do have reason to believe that, that this administration has pr pressured Turkey to not invade. Um, and I do um, believe that there are is some pressure on them to not do that. So, the, I mean, it's not, I wish it was a vocal um, condemnation and I wish the international community made that, would make that very um, public, but, um, but I do think that there has been some pressure on them. And I hope that, um, that 
that the U.S. is using all the many tools they have behind the scenes to, to hurt the economy of, of Turkey. There are many things U.S. can do, can threaten privately that that should chill Erdogan to the bone if he thinks that they, they would do it, that, that should give him a disincentive to invade. Whether that's happening or not, I, I obviously can't say for sure, but I, I do believe there has been some strong pressure from the U.S. to push back an invasion. Great. Thank you. And kind of to piggyback off of that one, the next question is for Mrs. Sina Mohammed. says, we know the Syrian Democratic Council and SDF enjoy good relations with the De Defense Department. Have relations under the Biden administration improved when compared to the previous administration? Yes, thank you. Now for the uh, US administration, whether it is now the uh, Biden administration or the previous administration, we as the SDF and SDC, we worked with both of them. Actually, we started with the previous administration even in uh, having a partnership against fighting against the uh, uh, ISIS and the terrorists. And still it is continuing with this administration, fighting against terrorists and the uh, ISIS. So uh, even uh, we heard many, I mean, statements from both of the administration that they are committed uh, to the partnership with the SDF and the SDC also in order to uh, end the terrorists in Northeast Syria and to uh, end the ISIS. So it is good for us to have all this, but still we, uh, uh, we need uh, uh, more support for the SDF in order to be able to defend themselves more if they, uh, the United States military forces being uh, withdrawn because they will not stay there forever. So this is what we need. And I would like to thank for their support actually for the SDF, they are providing it. But still we need the support for the autonomous administration from the, for the SDF and even the support for the people of Afrin so that they can solve the problem in Afrin and ask Turkey and this military to withdraw so that the people of Africa can go back to their homes and to their cities. This is what I can say. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our next question is for Dr. Nazan Begahani. It says, uh, what can we do adv advocacy wise with women's groups worldwide to improve the lives of Kurdish and minority women and communities in areas of Rojava currently under Turkish army and jihadist occupation. Yes, thank you very much. I think it's from Margaret. Hi, Margaret. It's very nice to, to have you here with us today. Thank you for joining us. Um, I mean, as I said, uh, it's very difficult to conduct field work on sexual and gender-based violence. So this is the area of my specialty, uh, even in normal settings, because many victims, many uh, uh, survivors and their relatives uh, don't have the desire to talk about uh, these taboo issues uh, and uh, they don't have the, the desire to um, tell their stories. Uh, so we, we need multifaceted methods and ethical principles really to conduct field work in normal settings. Now in the, in the conflict zones, the situation is becoming more difficult and challenging, especially in, in Rojava, as I said, the U.S. State Department in, 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 in its report indicates that uh, since the withdrawal of, um, uh, of um, uh, the American forces and also the occupation of Turkey and uh, um, uh, the uh, control of the area by Turkish-backed militia groups, uh, um, it's uh, very difficult for scholars, for uh, humanitarian workers and researchers working with different uh, human rights organizations to go on the ground and to collect data. So we've been uh, relying mainly on second-hand data uh, collected by local NGOs, by local um, agencies, and also by uh, brave women's rights advocates, and there are many of them both at home inside uh, uh, Afrin and in the wider Rojava, but also uh, in the diaspora. Uh, so we do need multifaceted uh, um, uh, approach with ethical principles. Uh, 
uh, to collect data in order to produce evidence-based uh, uh, knowledge about these crimes. And if these crimes are not, uh, um, are not documented, of course, it will be more difficult to, um, to take action and to prosecute uh, perpetrators. Um, now, uh, uh, regarding the uh, displaced women, uh, I mean, as, as you mentioned, uh, the, um, the situation is very complicated. Uh, you mentioned in, in, in your second uh, uh, comment, uh, the children, foreign children uh, and their mothers, uh, widows, wives uh, of ISIS fighters. Um, I mean, we do need uh, um, to take the complexities of the reality into consideration and uh, have effective focused uh, policies and intervention in order to deal with the uh, reality uh, in the best way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. And our, we have time for one more question. Uh, it's for Professor Manan. Yeah says the United States is usually the first to be blamed for not doing more to prevent Turkey's atrocities against Kurds. What about European nations? What can the international community do to hold Turkey accountable and reverse what has happened over the past four years? Uh, I think it's up to us Kurds. If we are clever, we have to organize ourselves everywhere to see the uh, parliamentarian, the politician, the writer, in order to convince them we Kurds are your friends. We have been your ally. We are your ally in Iraq, in Turkey, in Syria. We have been fighting together. If you want to respect your words, your value, you have to help Kurds. Otherwise, if we eliminate Kurds in Syria, in Turkey, in Iraq, there will be Islamic State, either Shiite State ruled by Iran or uh, extremist Sunni trolled by Turkey or Qatar. So everything is clear. So it's up to us and we have to tell them frankly, if you respect your value, you respect your allies, your friends, we have to fight. Otherwise they will come to bomb in Paris, in Washington, everywhere. So we have to first assume our duty as a court, not only court of Syria, if we solve the problem of Syria, court of Syria, then will be solved in Turkey, in Iraq, in Iran, everywhere. Thank you, Professor. Uh, does anyone have any closing remarks? Or uh, the Paul asked the question about what should uh, they do? What should yes, you know, one can do to to support. Uh, uh, people in, in, in Afrin and in the wider region. Um, I think we need to, uh, to uh, mobilize uh, ourselves and our resources in order to uh, set up transnational activism, to put pressure on, on our respective governments uh, um, and uh, um, uh, help to produce evidence-based data so that perpetrators of these crimes are uh, held accountable. Um, and uh, uh, the ultimate aim would be to advocate for setting up a special tribunal uh, uh, to, to bring perpetrators to, um, uh, to court in, in the same way as uh, in, uh, in, in Rwanda and uh, former Yugoslavia. Thank you, doctor. And if, uh, does anyone else have anything to add? If not, uh, I yeah. guess we'll go ahead and conclude. Yes, sir. Yes, professor. Yeah, I want just to, to add one thing. I think we have to know we have, as a court, as political party, we have to recognize our mistakes. There have, have been done a lot of mistakes. Now, for me in Syria, we have a, uh, a historic occasion to, to build new Syria. And the only force staying in Syria is the Kurds. I think Syrian people does not uh, believe anymore in Assad with his family. For if we look at the Arab uh, 
were mostly become Qaeda or Daesh. No one believe of them. Uh, who stay? The Druze are minority. Assyrian are minority. Only the Kurds, if we are clever, we work together with the help of our friend, other Kurds in Turkey, in Iraq, that we can build new Syria. It will be better for all the Middle East, even for the West. So it's now we, are, we don't have to lose this uh, historic occasion. We have to recognize our mistake, to work together in order to build a new Middle East. Otherwise, we will disappear. Turkey won't uh, come back from uh, Syria, nor from Afrin, nor from Jazeera. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, I, I would just like to real quick just jump in and say that, that while you know this, this began as a Kurdish project, of course, it's now the autonomous administration is actually a majority Arab project now. So I think it's super important to, to consider um, because I think most of the international community is unaware of the fact that it's such an inclusive government with, you know, Turkmen, Yazidis, Christians, um, Syriac Assyrians, converts, Arabs, um, all participating at every single level of government. So I, I do think this is a model that can be looked at in the future as one to, that could be set up in, in even in fragile areas. But, but the important part is, is this is a way forward for Syria, starting from the Northeast, and, and the, the international community needs to give it a lot more attention than they have. So thanks again for having me. And it's been a really, I really appreciate it. Other- and thank you yeah. to all of our other thank panelists. You so much. And hopefully next year, we're not discussing five years after Afrin's okay. occupation. We'll be discussing the liberation of Afrin. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, so much. Thank you, thank you very so much. much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Great thank rest you. of your day. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.